In this episode, you'll learn how reflecting on your current worldview might help you to solve some of the biggest challenges we face today and make you a better service designer. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Tristan, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 101. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is a surfer, a designer with a PhD in philosophy and he speaks Japanese. His name is Tristan Schultz. I'm really excited to share this chat with Tristan with you because this episode isn't about the latest tools or methods, although we'll be mentioning some. It's much more about understanding who you are as a designer. What are your existing mental models, your assumptions and your biases that originate from a certain worldview? Because once you understand that, that might just be the key that helps you to design real solutions that we really hard need for the big challenges we face today. Before we jump into the chat with Tristan, this is episode 101. And if you're new to this channel, please subscribe as we bring at least one new video a week that helps to level up your service design skills. And don't forget to click that bell icon to be notified when new videos are out. That's all for the intro. And now let's quickly jump into the super fascinating chat with Tristan Schultz. Welcome to the show, Tristan. Thank you. We're again, uh, literally across the planet on the other side of the planet. Where are you right yeah. now? I am in beautiful Gold Coast, Australia. It's on mm. the East Coast uh, and about 100 kilometers south of Brisbane. It's um, yeah, beautiful place. This is where I've grown up. For the people who haven't checked your LinkedIn profile yet or your website, which all the links are down below, uh, tell us a little bit about you and who you are, what you do. Yeah, well, I am a designer. I guess that's the, the first thing that I describe myself as. Uh, I'm a Gamilaroi man. The Gamilaroi is the name of the, the country, the Aboriginal country that um, my heritage is from. Uh, so I'm an Aboriginal person as much as European heritage as well. Uh, I am a surfer and really I am, you know, a, a kind of a, a critical, strategic, interdisciplinary designer, I guess all of those things wrapped in one. So I don't try and define myself as um, any discipline. Hmm. <coughs> You are also going to do something at Surfdesk 2020, right? Correct. Yes. When it what was that? happens, <laughs> uh, I'm going to be the keynote at Surfdesk 2020 with, um, uh, so what I'm going to do is we're going to have a, a dialogue with an Aboriginal elder uh, who's a, a mentor of mine and a really respected designer as well here in Australia from an Indigenous perspective. And we're going to, yeah, have a kind of a, a bit more of an informal relational interrogation into what service design is during mm. our keynote. Mm. Looking forward to that. Let's hope Service 2020 happens. Uh, maybe it already happened, depending on whenever people are listening to this episode. Um, Tristan, do you remember your first encounter with service design? Well, my first encounter with service design. Um, I don't particularly remember the first encounter with service design. I, I feel like I, I remember conversations during my master's research, um, let's say about uh, 2010, uh, where we, do, we did talk about service design through uh, my professor kind of introduced me to this, not, not so much the notion of service design, but services and user-centered design. And um, we used to have some pretty robust conversations about that language being problematic because, mm. um, you know, what, what it can kind of describe is that you're, you as a designer are a service provider. You're providing a service to the status quo and the status quo is already established and you don't have a say in disrupting that status quo when really, you know, that's certainly not the way I see design. So my first introduction into service design was, um, I think, quite... Um, 
dubious about mm. its its ambitions. Um, but you know, I've come to understand service design is much more broad and complex than that. Regardless of uh, you know, there's lots of things that are doing service design that um, aren't called service design. Sure. And I, I think service design can just let itself breathe and be open a bit. And I, I welcome all those people here <laughs> into this community. Uh, and I'm sure we'll dive into uh, your perspective on, on service design and how, how we can broaden it, because that might be super valuable. Um, you have the question starters. I have your topic. For the 101st time, are you ready to do interview jazz? Sure, let's do okay. it. Let's do it. <coughs> um, topic number one. I have sm smaller notes today uh, so that actually fit on the camera. Systemic view. Do you have a question started that goes along with this one and can you show it up? Yeah, sure. Uh, let's go with uh, when will. Mm -hmm. so, so when, when will. will yeah. When will the world and then service design move towards a systemic view of life yeah you started with a with an easy question <laughs> <laughs> where is this question coming from let's start let's start there wow where is the question coming from well the question comes from uh cartesian knowledge or a guy called rene descartes <laughs> who was a philosopher some many hundreds of years ago who thought it'd be a good idea to come up with this idea of a Cartesian view of life or a dualist view of life. Uh, and, you know, that kind of says mind and body are separate and, you know, all of these things and this over-rationalization of life. Uh, and that caught on. It caught on really well. And then it turned into things like the Enlightenment, things like modernity, uh, and that dualist view, that over-rational, that scientific rational view is still the predominant worldview mm -hmm. in Western societies today. But it's not the worldview for many other cultures around the world who have much more of a systemic and relational worldview. Uh, and in fact, you know, all cultures did before, let's say, um, modernity come along in their own different ways. Uh, but there's a lot of movement in the last few decades in particular around, you know, you, oh, I'm sure you've aware of systems thinking and these sorts of things. Um, and there's a lot of movement to really not just think about it as thinking, but think about it as really adopting a completely new worldview to deal with the pressing challenges that we have going forward. Uh, and so that's going to be really tough for everybody over the coming decades. But uh, I really see that there is going to be a clash of those worldviews between that, the, the residue of modernity and these other movements of moving back towards or reinscribing or moving to some new version of a systemic view of life, which takes in holism, ecology, uh, indigenous knowledge, um, Lo you know, lots of different words that we could describe for what a systemic view of life is. And so what does that mean for service design? That, well, was, that was my next question, yeah. Well, for ser if service design is about kind of uh, mirroring what is for the status quo, well, the status quo may well change. Mm -hmm. Or is service design about nudging uh, mm -hmm. towards a more ambitious value set of the status quo? And is that a systemic view of life? So how does service design adopt systems thinking, um, systemic design practices into the certain, uh, you know, the individual methods and tools and techniques that it uses to take people through um, uh, designerly thinking to get them towards understanding services? Uh, do you have just uh, for the sake of time, just like one example that you find inspiring where you've seen like a systemic approach systemic view within service design and like the how I, I think a lot of people will be might be inspired by this and now they are thinking but how yeah. um, well there's a there's a there's a couple of um, sorry my microphone says it appears to be noisy but we'll carry on um, there is a couple of really great 
tools and techniques out there, guides out there. And I think that that would be the best place to sort of refer people to. So um, the transition design movement Mm -hmm. certainly comes from a systemic view. Um, It's got its traps and problems like others, but it does. There is a guide called the Systemic Design Guide that is freely downloadable and usable online. And, you know, and then, you know, I've got my own tools and techniques and methods as well, but really it starts there with even before a design brief is created around what we're going to do as services, it starts with, well, what ways are we going to sort of onboard a project? How are we going to ask people to map out what it is that their wicked problems are? Are we going to use this rationalized version of a journey map or are Mm -hmm. we going to use this, this really relational version that might seem harder at first, but, um, kind of nudges and and prompts to have to deal with all of that relational complexity. So I'd like to point people to the examples of, say, some of the transition design workshop um, tools and and systemic design workshop tools, even the the new circular design guide, I think it's called, um, which, you know, emphasizes um, how to move towards circular economies, obviously, is a good toolkit um, to for service designers to perhaps use in their toolkit rather than the more common ones that people go to what do you hope like um what would be the next logical step forward for you like where if we want to challenge ourselves as a service design community and we want to uh, go more towards a systemic approach like adopting these toolkits might be a good idea um should we challenge our clients? Is there like, uh, should we challenge ourselves? Where is, mm. what's the next step? Both, we have to challenge our clients and ourselves. Mm. Um, you know, so in many ways, a systemic view of life is as much about um, colonialism as well, actually. And I know that uh, in, in some Northern European countries, that's, that's not as much of a loaded term, but certainly here in Australia, this idea of colonialism is very potent because we were colonized and indigenous peoples were oppressed and their knowledge was destroyed. So in Australia and in many parts of the world, people are trying to decolonize their worlds. And a part of decolonizing their worlds is to kind of re-inscribe that systemic view of of understanding the world uh, and have that contribute to society. So decolonizing is not about just kicking everyone out and and starting again, it's, it's about kind of adopting these epistemologies like systemic views of life or what even is called ontologies um, into, into the way we do things. So where would we start? What that means is actually it's not just indigenous people that are colonized. It's all of us. All of our minds are colonized with this kind of overly dualist, overly mm. rational view of life. And so where, say, we, meaning we, the the broad and general service design community would start is in unlearning that way, is kind of decolonizing our own minds so that we can then begin to learn what there is to learn in front of us from other worldviews, and then we can move into practice Hmm. itself. So it's it's excruciating, and I take people through this in in workshops and clients even sometimes through this. And... um, you know, hopefully I can build it into the project budget at the same time because it takes a lot more time to work with a client about what it is we need to unlearn uh, in our own habits and behaviors and worldviews and biases before we can even begin to even put together a design brief about what we're trying to achieve here. So if, if the price is that high, what is the benefit? Like, why why do you believe that it's so important to actually go through all this pain and, and, <laughs> and pursue this? Yeah. Uh, look, it, you know, it's pretty clear to me from my perspective that, um, you know, modernity has been really fantastic in many ways, but has been terribly destroyed, uh, you know, has terribly destroyed all kinds of other things. So there's a darker side to modernity. Uh, and really... That, that darker side does not offset the benefits that we've had out of modernity. It may for some, for the haves, but for the have-nots, it's been absolutely devastating. So what does that mean really practically in relation to sustainable futures? Well, what modernity essentially did was destroy options for us to think about what futures could be. 
Uh, and so we, we, we have no way to really even comprehend different worldviews and different options for being sustainable or having sustainable, what a service is, a sustainable service from that worldview because we just can't see it anymore. Uh, and so, yeah, the implications are that until we kind of unlearn and open up and learn how we can sort of think more systemically, we're not going to find options to the the most pressing problems that we have, mm. such as, you know, the easy one like climate change um, and many other wicked problems. We're not going to solve modern problems with modern solutions. Yeah, yeah. So if we, the benefit of this is that it, it, it opens up a vast new uh, area of po potential solutions. It's 100% right. Okay. Yep, that's what this is all about. Hmm. This, well, you know, it's twofold. Even before that, what it's about is liberating billions of people around the world to be for them to sort of be able to think for themselves and decide on their own futures based on their own worldviews and their own terms. Uh, and as a uh, byproduct of that, we will receive a plethora of new options for how to navigate futures. All right. <clears throat> Super inspiring. Um, but let's move on to topic number two. And it's sort of intertwined. So um, you used this word, and I have to be honest, I never heard of this word. So you're going to start, hopefully, by explaining to me what it is. It's about indigenous knowledge. And do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so perhaps I, I'll, I'll put it back on, on, on yourself since, you know, for whatever reason you may not have heard of it, perhaps what is it in your world and where, yeah. why, why haven't you heard of it? Why do you think you haven't? What is it about your geography or, or what is it? Do you think? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, Apparently, it's not in the vocabulary. It's not uh, in the uh, sphere of talking, attention. Are you talking about the two words together, or obviously? well, the word indigenous uh, no, knowledge is is a word that's <laughs> that's quite common, yeah. but indigenous yeah. uh, is not indigenous. Yeah, exactly. Well, I can't yeah. even pronounce it. Uh, okay. It's not uh, common, at least uh, in my surrounding. Right. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know. There's, there's there may be a term in uh, in your more native tongue, but indigenous is just those people that are native to that land, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And and so in Australia, as much as we call Australian indigenous people Aboriginal people, that's only the term for Aboriginal people on the mainland. The term for people in what's known as the Torres Strait Islands at the top of Australia, they're Torres Strait Islanders and you would not call them Aboriginal people. Uh, and of course, there's all kinds of people over in the Pacific Islands. They're called all kinds of other things, but they're also indigenous people, just as North American mm -hmm. Indians are indigenous mm -hmm. to that mm -hmm. land. Mm -hmm. So indigenous, that's all it means. Um, indigenous knowledge put together is to say, well, what is, de what is deriving from that knowledge from those people in that land, mm -hmm. wherever they are in the world? So, yeah, basically the knowledge that's in the surrounding, that's in the context, that's in the, uh, it, it is tied to geography, I guess, right? Yes, very much tied to geography. It is about um, geographically placed knowledge that has been there for, in Australia, at least 60,000 years or more. Mm. So, you know, some people like to call it, call it the term traditional knowledge. But there's issues with using that term traditional as if this is the old knowledge mm. and all of this mm. new modern stuff is the new knowledge. So th there's a problem with calling it that when really what it is, is this indigenous knowledge the same way as there's Western knowledge on there's Chinese knowledge. And of course, sure. inside indigenous knowledge, there's many, many yeah. knowledge pockets. Aboriginal Australian indigenous knowledge is, in totally, is totally different to other parts of the world. And in fact, inside Australia, there are, um, you know, over 400 different um, kind of Aboriginal groups who all would have their own conception of what 
their fundamental indigenous philosophy and indigenous knowledge is. Yeah, is it, is it around also culture, uh, norms, uh, all those kind of things? Yeah, but it, it's also the, the really practical stuff mm. too. Like here's indigenous, here's an indigenous knowledge understanding of architecture. Mm -hmm. And here's an indigenous knowledge understanding of water technologies. Um, here's an indigenous knowledge understanding of social structures and social binds and relationships. Here's uh, an indigenous knowledge understanding of agriculture. I, maybe uh, I'm making a too simplistic uh, leap, but would indigenous knowledge also apply to uh, the knowledge just embedded in a company? Uh, or, or, or wouldn't you? Yeah. No, you you wouldn't use that term. You would. There might be some other term for that. I'm not sure, but um, you know, the, I guess we know the term is kind of corporate knowledge and, and that sort of okay. that language. But uh, it's it's not about that. It's about uh, you know, there's generally if there's a thing that binds indigenous knowledge, it's it's knowledge that comes from country, comes mm. from place. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, yeah. So. What does this mean again for the field that we're in? Like, again, why are you passionate about this? Because you are. Yeah. Well, look, indigenous knowledge, as I mentioned, um, you know, some of those examples, like, say, food and agriculture or water technologies or something like that. Now, if you're, say, uh, in the public service uh, and you are the region's kind of water planning um, service, uh, then certainly in Australia, it is incumbent on you more and more in the last few years in particular to incorporate understandings of indigenous knowledge into how you plan for water for the citizens in your place. So what that means is, uh, you know, and, and this is in my head because we're working on a big water project, um, is that as much as it might be, okay, water planning for irrigators, water planning for the environment, water planning for industry what about water planning for cultures what does what does what is a cultural lens on water and its value and that value might not be economic that value might not be tacit uh, and so how do we how do we respect in our water plan the value that indigenous people place on water uh, and so and, and then how do we service that how do you are there any other methods to surface uh, indigenous knowledge different compared to the research methods that we already know, or are they, are they similar? Look, so the methods for me uh, uh, go back to how we kind of approach the, the questions in the first place and what methods, what mapping methods. For me, it's about what mapping methods and, and interrogation questions we ask at the outset. So. Um, you know, instead of say a linear journey map, uh, who a user is, go, you know, mm -hmm. on a journey, mm -hmm. uh, it might be a much more messy and creative process in that moment. Uh, and we might be asking people to go back thousands of years and respect what that ancestral knowledge is saying as much as what um, what is you know being said last year or the year before. But it also might be something more deep, where we might take people through a process. Um, from an indigenous knowledge perspective, where we're asking them to respect the patterns that are emerging in that mapping as much as the content that's emerging. So the actual visual patterns, mm -hmm. the visual the, the visual forms and stuff that's emerging. And we might be letting that speak back to us as valid knowledge production as much as the, 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 the facts, the data that's coming out of it. Uh, and so we take people through what's called yarning, sessions a yarning circle or a talking circle uh is a, is an indigenous version of, of a kind of a respectful deep dialogue and and we when we add sort of pattern thinking and visual pattern thinking to that we're putting cards and images in the middle of that that circle and we're letting the the overall form of of those patterns speak back to us you know so maybe um uh, maybe a person running turns up in the total form that we're seeing what does that mean why is that person running what can you turn over the card on the on the front foot what does the card on the front foot say mm. oh it mm. says 
it says that we should be doing this or well, how do we feel about that so that more relational layered way of producing knowledge um, is how indigenous knowledge uh, would contribute to service design questions right at the start and it's really interesting because i think um if I look back at, at my career in the last 12, 13 years of service design, it was really hard to um, to uh, prove the value of that kind of knowledge. You, like you feel right. it's there, everybody feels it's there, but- We all get the tingles, don't we, we you know? Exactly, yeah. and yeah. Uh, you can sort of point at it, uh, but it's then really hard, at least it was for us, to put it into commercial projects. Yeah, yeah. And so look, it, you know, all of this can start to sound really kind of whimsical and magical and, and, and all these sorts of things. But actually, all, all that Indigenous knowledge is saying about this is, and this connects to systemic view, is we live in a visual and relational world where everything is interconnected. And neuroscience is telling us this now anyway. So it's catching up with Indigenous knowledge. Uh, therefore, if we live in a visual and relational world, visual and relational patterns will emerge if we just find the right way to read those patterns. And it's what I'm understanding. It's also about accepting that this kind of knowledge is valid knowledge, is as valuable as scientific data or... Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so the two... The two come together and you know we've heard about the sciences and the arts going through this and or even just the science and humanities and and artists embedding themselves in um in in scientific labs and stuff to to give creative and artistic responses mm. now the ones that are really valid and listened to is when those artistic and creative responses are treated as well, that's some really valid knowledge production there that we scientists need to listen to uh, and the same goes for indigenous knowledge. Indigenous people across the world are being embedded into um, departments and service areas and design um, companies and big business to offer that lens hmm. that because we have 500 years of modernity on our shoulders, we just can't, we meaning we sure. sort of yeah. m modern people can't, just can't see. Hmm. Hmm. It as with the uh, question about systemic view, if people are interested by this, want to learn more, are there any resources that you would recommend? Yeah, so um, certainly the uh, uh, the the website that I mentioned before, I think if you just Google a systemic design guide, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, just on that systemic do, not in relation to the indigenous knowledge part of, of a systemic view, um, hold on, I've just lost my own little thing here. Let me get that up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, here I am. Uh, in relation to systemic view of life, um, there's a book. In fact, I've got it here. Hold on. Yeah, sure. No, I don't. And I'm, I'm messing <laughs> with you. That was a cliffhanger. <laughs> yeah. Uh, somewhere, but it'll take too long. Um, Fre uh, free uh, Caproff. Um, anyway, there's a book called The Systemic View of Life, mm -hmm. which is a good kind of textbook starter um, that outlines the history of how this, this, this kind of tension unfolded and the future of how, you know, these new disciplines, whether it's ecology in environmental sciences or um, systemic uh, thinking or, or many others come together and are coalescing as we go forward. I'll try to link Systemic to the of life. book. Yes. Mm. Okay. Let's uh, move into the third and final topic. And it's just one word here on this paper, but I'm sure there's a whole world behind it. Uh, <laughs> it's universal. Oh, shit. shit. You've picked um, uh, the easy topics for this day. Universal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I can... All right, let's try what if. All right, what if. Uh, what, what if universal design just doesn't exist? 
What what is your what is your perspective on universal design? Well, it, it is a thing. I've actually got another book here, and a really famous book that is called Universal Design. <laughs> and, and in many ways, in many ways, universal design is 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 trying to achieve like a simple thing around, say, um, you know, accessibility for the most amount of people. So, if we're designing services for disabled mm -hmm. people, if we're designing a bus stop, Stan standards. Yes, the, 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 the most optimum universal standards that meet mm -hmm. the needs of the most amount of people. And that's, mm -hmm. a, fair, that's a fair ambition. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Um, but it very quickly kind of lends itself towards uh, uh, kind of setting in place standards, as you said, um, modern version of man, modern measurements of man, based on a hubris, based on a, on a worldview and agenda from somebody at some point in time. Sure. Um, you know, so those, those modern measurements of man are based on modern white European males. And there's all kinds of um, issues around that. Um, you know, data and user experiences in the digital realm uh, are based on um, perceptions that come out of Silicon Valley by mm -hmm. a young white males who who you know often can't do their own laundry mm -hmm. um and so you know there's these kind of universal conceptions that are imposed across the world and it's almost like a neo-colonialism it's a new colonialism opposed through digital um artifacts through digital technologies uh and so what if what if it's just universal design is just not the way to think about it what if and, and then the other part of the thing about this is what if we never went down that road? What if modernity never did try and universalize and did try and um, export knowledge everywhere across the world? So what's, what the if, alternat what's the alternative? Well, um, plural worldviews. So plurality, um, like literally a pluriverse is the alternative. And, you know, I didn't make up that term. There's, there's plenty of people to think about it. So what if... What if we were living in a pluriverse, not, not, not in that conspiracy mm -hmm. theory of um, pluriverse, but what if different worlds across this globe were in different worlds, in different moments in time, conducting their, going about their life in their own ways and never had colonialism or modernity imposed on them? What would the vastly different services and ways of being look like? If that occurred well and it's all it, that's how reality looks like the world is different everywhere it is well is it but is it, to what extent is it different to, yeah that that's the question to what extent right and you, your uh, your take is that we should try to be less the same or more uh true to our local selves question mark yeah 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 we should we are we should have autonomy and modernity and colonialism took away autonomy and by the way there's a, there's another book um there's a there's an author called arturo escobar and he has recently very heavily started to get involved in the critical design field he's not a designer he's an anthropologist um but he's written a book for called designs for the pluriverse uh, and he, he kind of takes a look from the outside in at our world, not just only service design, but, um, you know, design futures and speculative design and critical design and social design and uh, all of these different movements, but also indigenous and vernacular design. Uh, and he makes an argument for that, that kind of plurality. What does autonomous design in place in a territory look like that's not inhibited by designs elsewhere i'm i'm trying to to see what has caused this uh well let, let's call it uh colonization uh and how do we, how do we go can we go back and uh, if so how i i can imagine that a lot of has been driven by commerce by the market like it's yeah. easier to scale. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's not going away like tomorrow. <laughs> well, is it? 
not, but <laughs> um, you know, there's been a, a pretty serious rupture in society uh, at present time called the coronavirus for those watching this in five years. 20, yeah. Uh, yeah. Good ambitions. 20 years. <laughs> yes. Um, and so we'll see what happens on the other side. But I, I think we're going to see radically different um, versions of economies across the globe. And we're going to see out, um, we're going to see sort of people taking different directions as well. The whole society is taken entirely different directions uh, and I also see because of sort of technologies and, and technological evolution over the next few decades we're going to see the haves and the have-nots and a big spectrum in between uh, and that gap's going to get wider and wider and wider and we're going to have, see all kinds of different informal economies that are not based on economic growth and productivism um, we're going to see circular economies really pick up and we may see whole societies whole nation states that otherwise seem like normal neoliberal nation states actually transition to something radically different. Um, you know, we know that the Northern European countries around where you're at are sort of more of that social democracy. And, and, but where, where will that go? If that continues down that road, will that be something radically different? So I guess what I'm trying to say is this is not going to communism or going to Marxism or going to just socialism. There's a politics emerging that we don't even know how to define yet. And I think over the next 20 years, we're going to see that emerge and we're going to then have to adapt services to that. The other thing we're going to see, of course, is because of climate change, we're going to see people moving on unprecedented scales. Uh, you know, millions and millions and millions of people over the next 30 years are going to have to get up and get out of the way of climate disasters. Mm. Now, we're going to have to provide, in order for that, to be convivial, for it to be uh, prefigured, for it to be pleasant enough where it's just not totally traumatic for those people or just uh, a crisis, we're going to have to plan for that. We're going to have to do good service design to plan that out over time. Uh, and in order to really conceive, uh, you know, and speculate how that's going to go down and start to plan for it now, uh, we have to see long term and think long term. Unfortunately, we can't think long term because a part of sort of modernity in our worldview is to think really short term. So to deal with these pressing issues that are going forward, we urgently need to deal with our worldview in order to be able to even map them out with any um, warranted amount of complexity. Hmm. That's a... Uh, that's, uh... That's maybe the summary or the call to action from this episode. <laughs> like, uh, at least have a uh, investigate your existing world of view, and and it might be interesting to explore different worldviews, right? Yes. Is, is there a question that you'd like to ask the people who are listening or watching the episode? Uh, um. Look, I, I think that, that the question for people watching the episode is um, what are you creating and what are you destroying? And how are you justifying that value judgment? All right. In what yeah. you do in your service design practice mm. and in what you do in life as well. Mm. How do you make the, the trade off? Uh, would be interesting if people even think about it, but we'll see. We'll see what happens in the comments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if people want to continue this conversation with you, what's the best way to get in touch? Uh, just just go via uh, my website, relativecreative.com.au. And um, yeah, you'll, you'll find Tristan at relativecreative.com.au there and you're welcome to reach out anytime. Please do. Uh, everybody listening and watching to the 101st episode of the show. Tristan, uh, thanks so much for sharing what's on your mind these days. Uh, I, I okay. hope that it inspired a lot of people. Uh, we'll see how many comments and reactions you get. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sounds good. So coming back to Tristan's question, how do you make the trade-off between 
the value that you're creating and maybe the thing that you're just trying. How are you doing that? Are you doing it consciously? And do you have some kind of formula? Let us know down below in the comments. If you enjoyed this episode, grab the link and share it with somebody who might find it interesting as well. That way you'll help to grow the Service Design Show community and that helps me to invite more inspiring guests like Tristan here on the show for you. If you want to stick around and see more inspiring guests like Tristan that help to level up your service design skills, check out this video because we're going to continue over there. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.